the final day when the Lord on high returns in majesty. We will bow in wonder before the Lamb, and evermore the saints will sing. Yes, evermore the saints will sing. Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Utterbridge Parish Church for our service this morning. Whether you are new here or visiting or whether you've been a regular here for a while, you're all very welcome this morning and we're very pleased to have you with us. I'm Jackie Shapland, a member of the church family here, and I'll be leading our service this morning. If you are new, we'd like to invite you to join us after the service for refreshments in the parish centre, which is the building just across the lane there. You'd be most welcome to come and join us and it will give you an opportunity to chat to a few people and get to know them. Refreshments are also available in here on a self-service trolley. So if you prefer a quieter environment, you might like to stay here. If you don't mind the noise and the hustle and bustle and lots more people, then please join us across the way. So uh, Anna's got a couple of uh, things to tell us about, some news uh, that we'll be glad to hear about, I'm sure. Sound exciting? Oh, Jackie, always are. (laughs) Very exciting indeed, Jackie, that's right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Anna, the children's youth and families worker here. Um, The first thing to mention is tonight... We've got Youth Extra again, our second one, and the first one we had such a good time. So we'll be having sharing food together, lots of fun and games, and also thinking through how we can be living our lives for Jesus. So come along this evening if you're age Y7 to Y13. Anywhere outside of that, you're not invited. Yeah, it's exclusive for you lot, okay? So come along, that'll be 6 till 7.30 in the parish centre just here. Uh, You'll be super welcome. And the next thing uh, to mention is something that's been brewing for a long time. Lots of you have got it in a countdown calendar, I'm sure. It's our Kids Holiday Club. Uh, Epic Explorers. Uh, So from Wednesday the 29th, to Friday the 31st of May, just the mornings though, it's not a sleepover, Um, uh, (laughs) for primary aged uh, children aged 4 to 11 years, please come along, get booking now, invite all your friends, we've got lots of invitations uh, to be handing out, Um, and so book your place as soon as you can for that, because spaces are limited. Um, Also, though, think about a friend who you might like to invite in your class, perhaps, who you might like to uh, invite to come along to that too. We'd love to welcome them as well. 
If you're a teenager, if you're secondary school aged, and you'd like to be a junior leader, then we'd love for you to come along, but you'll also need to book your place, so just click the ticket that's for a junior leader. And if you're older than that, get in touch with me if you'd like to be there anyway. Uh, then uh, you can help out. We'd love to have uh, lots of leaders for that. Um, so that's to come. Very exciting. Thanks, Jackie. There's more excitement. Another new thing is about to begin. We're starting games evenings on Fridays. This will be beginning on the 26th of this month, and I think you can come to this whatever age you are. So there are no exclusions. Um, it says it's a time to play games and enjoy good company. Bring your own games and snacks. And it will be every week on Friday from 7.30 to 9.30 in the parish centre. But once a month beforehand, there will be a meal provided. And that will begin, the meal will be provided on the first week, the 26th of April. Sign-ups for the meal will be closed 48 hours before the meal. So I think that means that you have to book it by Wednesday tea time. But you'll all be welcome to that, and there will be more information in the, the church family email, news email that will be coming out tomorrow. So uh, do put that in your diary. And a reminder, too, about the 321 course to investigate the Christian faith. If you would like to come along or bring a friend, that will be beginning next Sunday in the afternoon. There are flyers available if you want to find more details. So we're going to start this morning uh, with a song. And now, sorry, we're going to start with a song, but I'll pray for us before we do that. Let's pray. Almighty God, you graciously invite us into your presence this morning as your beloved children. We appreciate this privilege. May we enjoy being with you this morning giving you our full attention. We come to you together as your family. May we have joy in one another, seeking to bring blessing. We come with open hearts and minds to worship you this morning. We come in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Now this song we're going to sing to start with is the new one we learned last Sunday which urges us to sing in response to all that God has done for us. I particularly like the first verse, because as I grow older, I do very often wake up in the morning thanking God that I'm still alive, <laughs> that I can get out of bed and I can do things, even though I do them probably with a creakier body than it used to be and a bit slower, and with a bit less energy, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm very thankful to God for that. You'll probably find other things that you're thankful for as we're singing this song. But let's stand and sing together uh, this, this new song that we learned last week. Please stand. Oh, sing all of creation. 
nation rise up and praise the king of kings and sing has the son of god died to take away your sin and set you free has the there has the son of god died to take away your sin and set you free and one of the reasons that for us to sing to jesus is that he did die to take away our sin and we are free from that sin that separated us from god free to come into god's family and as his children we don't want anything to get in the way of us enjoying that relationship with him those things that creep back into our lives that we know are not what our Father wants to see in our lives. So we're going to pray now together our prayer of confession, telling God that we're sorry for the things we have done that don't please him, and to restore our relationship with him. So please join in the words on the screen in yellow if you want to make this your prayer this morning. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done, and we have done those things that we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But you, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us sinners, Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a disciplined, righteous, and godly life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. A favourite passage of mine from Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that in Jesus we have forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. What a great assurance it is to know that that is true. And I love the idea in this verse that God's grace is lavish. I think that's a wonderful word. It means something more than just basic, something extravagant, even over the top perhaps. 
but he gives us so much more and at no cost to ourselves. And God la God's lavish grace spills over to us as he exercises his sovereign grace, his sovereign power with goodness on our behalf. And we're going to sing about that in our old age song this morning. So let's stand again and sing this song together. Thanks. things going on at the moment, uh, not least our new sermon series, which is beginning today. Over the next five weeks, both here in the church building and in Sunday Club down the road, we will be looking at the Old Testament book of Jonah. And today we're going to get going by looking at Jonah chapter one. But to help introduce the whole book, and to get us excited about what we've got coming up, we're going to watch a short video now.
The people of Nineveh weren't very nice. They were violent and vicious, to be quite precise. God told Jonah, a prophet, to warn them to change. But would God forgive them? That filled Jonah with rage. He just didn't trust that God knew what was best. So he boarded a boat that would take him out west. But because he was running from what God had warned, God sent a fearsome and furious storm. The sailors were shaking and deeply afraid. And they prayed to their gods that they would all be saved. They tried what they could, all while Jonah just slept, but then woke him for fear that they soon would be wrecked. Jonah knew what he'd done, and to save them from harm, said, throw me in the sea, and the storm will be calm. And the moment that Jonah was thrown in the sea, God stilled the storm, and the sailors believed. But what happened next, Jonah would not have wished. For to stop him from sinking, God sent a big fish. It swallowed him whole, right down deep to its belly. Things were desperate and dark, and incredibly smelly. And finally Jonah decided to pray. He remembered that God is the one who can save. He stayed in the fish for three days and three nights, till it spat him back out, which was not a nice sight. He was grubby and gunky, but clearly not dead, and decided that this time he'd do what God said. He went and warned Nineveh, slightly postponed. In 40 more days, you will be overthrown. And the way they responded, he'd never have guessed. They said sorry to God and were deeply distressed. They stopped doing evil and saw God could save. And so all they'd done wrong, God just freely forgave. But Jonah was fuming. This twist seemed all wrong. This is the problem I've had all along. You're a kind and compassionate God, Jonah spat. But it's wrong to forgive evil people like that. As he sat there and salt, God grew Jonah a shelter. He was pleased at the plant which was stopping him swelter. But God made it wither and said, that's just shade. So shouldn't I care for the people I've made? Jonah hated how God forgave people like them. Although he'd been forgiven again and again, we all need forgiveness. So God sent the one who said someone far greater than Jonah has come. And when he saw a city of evil, he cried. And to bring them forgiveness, he willingly died. Jesus, like Jonah, went down to the depths to free and forgive us, to save us from death. Looks like exciting weeks ahead for us, doesn't it? Um, it's time now for the children to go off to Sunday Club so you can get started on this story of Jonah. So while they do that, take the opportunity to chat with somebody sitting near you for a minute or two.
Right, I, th I think they're all safely on their way. <laughs> um, so, Steffi is going to come and lead us in our prayers this morning. Thanks, Steffi. Let's pray. Almighty God, we look at your world and our hearts are heavy at the suffering that takes place. We pray for the ongoing conflicts in Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, Sudan, Myanmar, Burkina Faso, and all over the world. We pray for civilians caught up in war and conflict, suffering because of the decisions of others. And we remember that you are the Lord who defends the cause of the orphan and the widow, and so pray that you would protect the innocent and defenseless. We pray for those in positions of power around the world to use their power for the good of all and that they would have wisdom to seek peace. Amen. Heavenly Father, closer to home, we pray for the leaders of our own nation and those in power. We pray for, polit for politics of wisdom, integrity, and policymaking for the good of all. Lord, be with Christian politicians particularly, enabling them to be an effective and gracious presence and influence in political debate. We pray that our country would be one where the gospel can be shared freely and that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness so that more and more people may come to find Christ. Amen. And now we're going to pray for our mission partners, Mark and Rebecca, in Southeast Asia. Lord, we give you praise for answered prayers and for those finding new life in you. Please be with Mark and Rebecca during the stress of the heat and the challenges of language learning. Lord, we pray for outreach opportunities, particularly this week with it being the Buddhist New Year festivals. And we pray that you would bless all of their endeavours as they seek to work for you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bring before you all the events and activities that are happening in the life of our church family. Protect us from being a church who simply organise things to do. Lord, would you be with us in our endeavours? And please would you thrill our hearts with the prospect of doing life together, walking alongside each other through the good and the bad. We pray especially for those who are unwell. We pray for Roy Womack, Doreen Brook, Evelyn Coulson, Owen Scarf, Joe Chapel. Di Elliott, Dave Elliott, Brenda Burks, Phoebe, Amelia Stockdale, Rachel Crapper, Andy Overton, Pam Dewsbury, Andrew Elwood, Brian Tomlinson, and anyone else known to you who is unwell or in need of prayer at this time. Amen. Heavenly Father, may we have hearts for the lost just like you do. Would you thrill our hearts with the joy of salvation that we can't help but share it with those around us? And so we name before you now those that we long to see in a personal relationship with you. May you give us opportunities to share your love with them this week. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather as your people this morning. And pray that as we hear your word read and preached, that your spirit would be at work to give us ears to hear what you have to say, eyes to see you more clearly, and hearts that love you and your ways more than ourselves. Amen. And we join together to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Steffi. Liturgy has not been a feature of my church background until I joined this church family, which was only two or three years ago. But I'm getting used to it. But um, recently, I've, I've been reading various things that have caused me to see that the creed, which we're going to say together next, 
is helpful to God's gathered people in strengthening our common faith as we declare it together. It can help us to stand firm in the faith which the Bible is always encouraging us that we should be doing. But the challenge is not just to recite the words, but to speak them meaningfully, isn't it? And this requires me to be making an effort to engage my brain and my heart. And so I pray that we will all do that as we stand together in a moment to declare our faith together. And after that, we're going to sing a song about God's lavish grace that we mentioned earlier that is there throughout our whole Christian experience from seeking him to save us to him leading us home to be with himself forever. So could I invite you to stand and to declare your faith, if this is your faith, and then we will go straight into the song. Please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
take a seat. We're now going to be focusing our attention on God's word to us. And in a moment, Dave will bring us our Bible reading and then Chris will come and speak. But first, let's pray. Gracious Lord, as we come to your word, open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your law. Amen. Thanks, Dave. Today's reading can be found on page 928 of the Church Bibles, page 928, and it's from the book of Jonah, chapter 1, reading to verse 15. Jonah 1, page 928. Jonah flees from the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo in the, into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Dave, for reading for us. Good morning, everyone. Um, lovely to see you. And thank you, Jackie, for leading our service this morning. And let me uh, just add uh, to Jackie's welcome my own. And particularly if you're visiting us this morning, I've seen a couple who are. You're very welcome. And thank you uh, for being with us this morning. Uh, this morning, as you will have picked up, we are beginning a new series in uh, the book of Jonah. And along with that great video uh, that we just saw, um, uh, we're going to have a bit of a shorter introduction this morning to some of the themes of the book of Jonah that we're going to see unfolded for us over the next few weeks. And so as we begin to uh, look at this book together now, uh, please have it open in front of you and let me pray for God's work among us now. Our loving Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp for our feet and a light on our path. And so we pray that this morning and over the coming weeks as we look at this book together, 
you would show us your way and the wisdom of walking in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, um, I'm going to say some words from a well-known song, and I want you to put your hand up if and when you are uh, convinced that you know what song uh, these lyrics are from. Okay, so this is a little test for you. And now, the end is near. A few hands. Let's keep going. And so I face the final curtain. A few more hands. I'll give a few more lines to help some of you out. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that was hard not to get into the song and start singing it. <laughs> I've, I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway. And more, much more than this. <laughs> I did it my way. Thank you very much. You, you do know it. Frank Sinatra's song, My Way, is really one of the great anthems of our age, isn't it? It's a very rousing, stirring, uh, motivating kind of song. It makes you want to go out and face the world and live it your way and, and take the blows and stand tall and not be one who kneels down, but one who uh, takes it and lives uh, in whatever way feels good to you at, the, at that moment. And it, it leaves you believing somehow that if you do that, then at the end of life, you'll be able to sing with frank regrets. I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. The question is, is that really reflective of the reality of life? Uh, Jonah is the story of a man who tried to go his own way. But it is not one that gives the same message as Frank Sinatra's song, quite the opposite. It is an expose of the folly of living my way. But it is more than that. Um, I think it was about two years ago I went to our back door and uh, started to open the back door and immediately two things told me that something was wrong. One was that I felt this resistance on the door that I, I shouldn't, it wasn't opening as it should have done. The other one was there was this almighty creaking and cracking noise. And so I, I quickly kind of stopped pulling on the door and looked through the gap and one of my children, who will remain nameless, was there with something wedged in the outside of the cap flap. And when I was pulling the door, it was threatening to break this thing. And so I was trying to persuade him to stop doing what he was doing to the cap flap. And to my shame, I have to admit, I did raise my voice and get rather annoyed at him. And when he then eventually relented, I did give him quite a good dressing down for what he had done. And he walks a few meters away into the garden and starts sobbing into his hands. I know, you're thinking, terrible father now, aren't you? <laughs> so was I at that moment. But then it got an awful lot worse because I just noticed out of the corner of my eye, somewhere else in the garden, one of my other children come over to him. And he put his arm around him and said something to this effect. He said, it's okay. Daddy was just a bit annoyed because you shouldn't really have been doing that to the cat flap. And you're not in any more trouble. You don't need to cry. It's okay. And I was there, unknown to both of them, just listening into this. And I felt so rebuked. I went in and said to Rebecca, I've just been taught parenting by our five-year-old. <laughs> he actually dealt with the situation so much better than I did. I was thoroughly rebuked. And look, Jonah, in a similar way, doesn't just show us the folly of going our own way. It shows us a better way. It shows us a much, much better way. And at the end of it all, we have to decide which message we believe and which message we will live by. The message of Frank Sinatra, that when I live my way, life is at its best, or the message of the book of Jonah, that living God's way is the best way. And actually, you know, that's not a decision we make at one point in our lives or at a few key moments in our lives. It is actually a decision that in all the micro moments of life, day by day, we are making. Am I in this decision, in this act, in this behavior, in my thought life, in the way I behave at home and at work, am I going to live my way or am I going to live God's way? And it is a hugely consequential 
decision for us and those around us. So to help us decide which way we will live, cue the story of Jonah. And right up front, as we come to this story, we see the difference between God's way and Jonah's. Look down at verses 1 to 3. This book begins very much like many of the other prophets. The word of the Lord came to, insert name of prophet, son of, insert name of the prophet's father. This is how lots and lots of the prophets begin. But the way that Jonah is different is that the rest of the book doesn't contain the words of God through Jonah. Jonah is the story. And God's behavior with Jonah is the story. It's rather like a journalist becoming the story when normally they're just meant to be the one that reports it. See what happens. Verse 2, God says, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, one of the things to quickly get clear in our heads is that Nineveh was to the east, and Tarshish was due west across the sea. And so God says to Jonah, I should be doing it the other way around for you, shouldn't I? Should I? Yeah, yeah, east is this way for you, isn't it? God says, go to Nineveh. And he does exactly the opposite. He goes to Tarshish. Now, why does he do that? To, that? to understand that, we need to know a little bit of the history in which Jonah is living. Jonah lived in Israel in about the middle of the 8th century BC. And at that time, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, the great regional superpower of the day. And it was ruled by Emperor Shalmaneser III. And we know from other historical sources that this emperor and the Assyrians generally were unspeakably brutal and sadistic in their treatment of their enemies. And when I say unspeakably, I literally mean I could not bring myself in this setting and in almost any, probably, to describe the things that we know that they did. They are unbelievably appalling. Uh, they've been rightly, I think, described as a terrorist state. And they, they were right there on the border of Israel, enemies of Jonah's people. And so it is absolutely shocking to Jonah that God would give him an instruction to go and preach to this people. Really? Then the last people in the world that an Israelite prophet would want to go and preach to. It would be like a Jewish rabbi being told to go and do street preaching in Berlin in 1941. Unthinkable. And yes, okay, God says in verse 2 to go and preach against this city. But there would have been no point in sending Jonah to preach against them if there wasn't at least the possibility of God's judgment being averted. And that is exactly why Jonah fled to Tarshish. One way to consider and to talk and to preach through the book of Jonah, one quite two-dimensional way, is to simply uh, see all the deficiencies in Jonah and have a good laugh at him and say, oh, isn't he awful? And we shouldn't be like Jonah, should we? But I think that understanding the historical context of this should make us a bit more sympathetic to Jonah, actually. Yes, he does wrong. Yes, he goes against God's words. But he was being asked to do an incredibly difficult thing. And in the same situation, I dare say I'd do the same. But we know very clearly that this is why Jonah fled to Tarshish, because he tells us so in chapter 4. Uh, by this point, God has forced Jonah to go to Nineveh. He has preached. They have repented. And God has relented from sending judgment. And then for that very reason, look at chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, 
slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah is absolutely spitting feathers with fury at God, that he would show his grace to this nation, the enemy of God's people who have treated them so appallingly. He's furious that God would be so apparently soft with the Assyrians as to forgive them. And that complaint that Jonah makes towards the end of this book really pulls back the curtains and shows us the heart of what's going on in this book. You see, it shows us the heart that stood behind God sending him to Nineveh. And it shows us the heart that stood behind Jonah fleeing instead to Tarshish. As for God's heart, while Jonah put his finger on it, he is gracious and compassionate. Gracious in this context refers to God's undeserved kindness. And it was undeserved. But Jonah is exactly the opposite. He is ungracious. He is conspicuously unconcerned for the good of the people around him. And the whole story of Jonah spirals out from this one starting point, that Jonah's heart diverges from God's. And so he departs from God's way to go my way. That is, he sails towards Tarshish. And it doesn't take long for us to begin to see the consequences of that decision. Look down at verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And this is the first thing that I think that we see from these verses, that every sin brings a storm. Uh, Sin is to rebel against God's way and go our own way instead. And that decision is never without consequence. Uh, This is one of the consistent themes of the Old Testament, both its narrative as we see the Israelites continually sinning and it continually going wrong for them, but also books like the book of Proverbs consistently teach that every sin brings a storm, that whenever we choose to sin, that decision brings suffering for us and those around us. In this instance, it brings suffering for Jonah and for the other sailors on the boat. Now, we need to be careful in understanding this principle. It doesn't always work the other way around. It doesn't mean that every storm is the result of sin. Of course, the book of Jonah is a, uh, uh, sorry, Job is a great example of that. Job hasn't sinned, and yet all these storms do come into his life, and in the end, he's vindicated. It doesn't always work that way around, but it does work this way around, that every sin brings with it a storm. We should all, without a great deal of time reflecting on it, be able to see this in our own lives. A few quick examples. Think of how a husband's selfish decision not to help with the household chores creates a climate of resentment within a marriage that poisons the home and any others who live in it or enter it. Think of how a harsh email quickly typed out late at night can send a colleague into a downward spiral of depression. Or think of how a lie that seemed so innocent at the time, when exposed, breaks down the possibility of trust in a relationship. Oh, we can go on and on and on, can't we? But do you see the point? Every sin brings with it a storm. Now, sometimes that is because God acts in discipline in that situation. That's what's happening here with this storm. God is stopping Jonah in his tracks. But other times, it's just a natural consequence of an action, like putting your hand in a fire, you're going to be burned. That's not because God is disciplining you at that moment. It's just that's the way he set up the universe. And every command, this is a good way to think about it, every command that God gives us is for our good. He doesn't give us arbitrary commands just because he feels power happy. He gives us good commands because he loves us. And if that's the case, it should be no surprise that every decision to go against his good commands will bring suffering. Uh, When we sin, it's like we're 
running our hands against the grain of the universe, we will get splinters. It's like playing Russian roulette with a fully loaded gun. Someone will always get hurt. Sin is never a victimless crime. There is never an inconsequential transgression. Never a stormless sin. Every sin brings a storm. And look, we live in a world full of storms, don't we? And that's because we live in a world full of sinners, including ourselves. As we look around at the world, what we see is our kingdom come. Jonah became convicted of this, it seems, uh, later in this chapter. There aren't many kind of silver linings on the character of Jonah, but this is perhaps one. If you look down at verse 12, he says to the other sailors, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Jonah does, in this small way, accept his fault, that this sin has brought this storm. And so look, uh, let me just draw that particular thing out for each of us uh, now. Is there some sin that you're aware of in your life at the moment? Some way that you are disobeying God knowingly, consciously. A way you're going your way instead of his. Maybe even as I say that for some here, God will be laying that very thing on your heart and drawing it to your attention. Maybe you can see how that's affecting those around you. How others in the same boat as you are affected by the storm of your making. Maybe it is less obvious to you, but we can be sure of this, that every sin brings a storm. Uh, The second thing I think we see from these verses is that every storm is a chance to see God's grace. And sometimes in the most surprising of places. Uh, Here we see wisdom and goodness found not in Jonah the prophet, from whom we should have been able to expect it, but rather in the pagan sailors. Read verses 5 and 6 with me. Verse 5, All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up! Call on your God! Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Now, someone has preached Jonah chapter 1 under the title, The World Rebuking the Church. And it's easy to see why. At every point in this chapter, the sailors outshine Jonah. Jonah, who is all snooty and looking down his nose at everyone who isn't an Israelite, is outshined by the very people he looks down his nose at. And in doing so, their example is a rebuke to him. You see, the God that Jonah claims to worship and serve is concerned for all people. His grace, his undeserved kindness, reaches out even as far as the Ninevites. This is one of the great things we see right through this book, just how gracious God is to all people, to Jonah, to the sailors, to the Ninevites. And yet we do not see that from Jonah. If anything, we see that in part from the sailors. If we compare the sailors in this chapter to Jonah, uh, these are the sort of things that we see. They act for the common good. There they are throwing barrels and parcels overboard, bailing the boat out, working for the common good of all on that ship, while Jonah does what? Sleeps down below deck. They urge Jonah to pray, not the other way around. Jonah doesn't pray to God at all in this chapter, which is astonishing when you think about it. They seek to preserve Jonah's life, even when he tells them to throw him overboard. They're reluctant. They try to find another way. They're keen to preserve Jonah's life, while Jonah is on this boat, and he doesn't seem to care that the Ninevites won't be saved as a result. This is why he's got on the boat, because he doesn't want to see the Ninevites saved. 
And this helps us just to think through, uh, let me teach you these kind of theological categories, okay? There's this idea of common grace, and there's this idea of special grace. Uh, God's grace, again, is the way that we see his kindness worked out in our lives. And here there is, I was talking to someone about this yesterday, here uh, we see that there is common grace throughout the world and in all people. Uh, We see his grace in that uh, people who don't know and believe and trust in God are still capable of great wisdom and great insight and great kindness and goodness towards people. That's because God's image is embedded in every human being. It is his grace in our lives that works out such that anyone can do good. And yet then there's this special grace, a particular grace, where God gives something good in a in a particular, in a unique way. And Jonah possesses that in a way that the sailors don't because the word of God has come to him. God has revealed himself to Jonah in a particular way. Uh, We have that in God's word. This is special grace uh, to us. And most of all, in knowing the Lord Jesus, God revealed to us uh, wonderfully in the person uh, of Jesus. But look, we should be capable as Christians of seeing goodness and grace in the lives of people who are not Christians and allowing that grace to point us back to the God from whom all grace ultimately flows. Too often I think that Christians go one of two ways. Christians either see evidence of God's common grace in the life of non-Christians and even people who follow other religions, and they take that to the extreme of saying, well, there there can't be anything wrong with them and what they believe at all, can there? And so you end up with basically liberal Christianity that says, well, it must all be true. They must all be the same God by different names, different paths up the same mountain, different arrows pointed at the same target. Uh, That's what all these different worldviews are. That's liberal Christianity. The other way is a kind of extreme harsh fundamentalism that says, well, if they don't have God's special um, grace in their lives, if they don't know and believe, then there can't be anything good about anyone who isn't our little group over here. Jesus comes onto the stage of human history and he teaches us truth and grace. And as Christians, we should be able to see and recognize God's common grace worked out in a believer, in in someone who isn't a believer, and yet at the same time be able to say that we believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father, because that's what he told us. And so as we look at the sailors here in Jonah chapter 1, they rebuke Jonah. The world rebukes the church. It points us back to the God from whom all grace flows. And so we've seen every sin brings a storm. Every storm is a chance to see God's grace worked out in people's lives. And finally, this final theme that we're going to see uh, unravel through the rest of this book is that every act of self-giving love brings life and peace. I look down at verse 15. This is how the storm is finally resolved. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. Now, one other uh, theological category for you uh, to understand the book of Jonah, and which is uh, shown in that video that we were just looking at, is what we call typology. Now, this is a really fancy word. You might think, oh, goodness, this is turning into a lecture. But it's actually a very simple idea. Um, And it's that right through the Old Testament, we have... Pictures of people and things that are put there to help us understand Jesus when he arrives. And so you get all sorts of uh, of people who reflect Jesus in some way, but in an incomplete way. They are types of Jesus. And you get those who are are very obviously the opposite of Jesus, and they're called anti-types of Jesus. So a, a really wicked king in the Old Testament is a kind of anti, of which there were many, is kind of an anti-type of Jesus, who is the king, who is everything those kings could have been and should have been, but wasn't. And then you get someone like King David, who was a great king, 
and, and looked in so many ways like he might be the one that Israel was waiting for, but then he failed. And it points us forward to our need of Jesus, the perfect and true king. And now we know that we're to do that same thing with Jonah, to see him in some way as a type of Jesus, because Jesus tells us to do exactly that. In Matthew 12, he says that the sign that he will give to the generation of his day is the sign of Jonah. Uh, Because just as Jonah went down to the dead for three days and was then raised back, so Jesus said that he would be. And he said of himself, one greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is the true and better Jonah. And this is how we see this even worked out in, the, in chapter 1 of Jonah. Just as every sin brings a storm, so every act of self-sacrificial love brings life and peace. And a demonstration of the ultimate reality at the heart of the universe, an unchanging God of self-giving love. Now, how do we see that here? Well, the way the storm is stopped is that Jonah is sacrificed that all the others on that boat might be saved. Now, he's only a type of Christ. He's not a great hero here. It was all of them or him, and he chose to sacrifice himself. And yet, in some small way, it is a sign of how our storms can be reversed, of how life can be given through our decisions, of how our decisions can bring peace instead of a tempest. And of course, the greatest act of self-sacrifice the world has ever seen is the death of Jesus on the cross. And that is a sacrifice that has the power to still every storm, whipped up by human sin, and to save every life that would otherwise be swallowed up in the righteous wrath of God. Jonah was thrown into a storm of his own making. Jesus threw himself into a storm of ours. And it's why later in the Bible, in Romans 5 verse 1, we read, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's why the promise right at the end of the Bible in Revelation 21 is one where there will be no more sea. The sea is drained for us in the self-giving sacrifice of Jesus On the cross. And so, this is one of the things we're going to see over the coming weeks as we continue to dig into Jonah that Jesus is the true and better Jonah. He is the one that shows us the best way, God's way, to live to those around us. And in doing so, rather than bringing storms that cause us and others harm, He is the one that brings us peace and promises ultimately on that final day to still every storm and to change our hearts as well. And so as we conclude this little introduction in Jonah, I'm going to just give us a few moments just to reflect and consider if there is a particular way that God is calling us to respond to what we see in this, this chapter. And then I'll lead us in prayer and then we'll sing. And so perhaps just as you turn to reflect, you may want to think again, is there some particular sin that I'm aware of in my life that is bringing a storm in the lives of me and others around me? Is there some example of grace in the lives of others around me that points me back to the one who is full of grace and love and laid down his life for all? And is there some way that in showing that love in my own life, I can still the storms of our making, whilst ultimately continuing to look to and trust in Jesus, who has promised to still every storm. A few moments of quiet. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the life of Jonah and in this story, we are shown both the folly of going our own way and the wisdom of going yours. 
And we pray that today and in the coming weeks as we study this book together, you would impress on our hearts the beauty of you, our gracious God, that we would turn from our rebellious ways, that we would follow you, and that ultimately we would entrust ourselves to the true and better Jonah, who was cast into that storm of our making to save us from it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to stand, we're going to sing a couple of songs that cause us to turn our eyes to the one who is uh, sovereign over all, uh, the one who holds us in all our circumstances in our hand, in his hands. And so let's stand and sing together, Behold Our God.
Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Say how 
Do have a seat. What a great and awesome God we've been beholding together this morning. Great beyond our human understanding, but one who seeks us out to offer his gracious love and bring us into relationship with himself. Thank you for being here this morning and being part of our worship. And if, as we close our time together, you feel that you'd like to know more about our church here at OPC and what we're about, then please pick up a Connect card at the back as you go out uh, and fill it in. It looks like this. If you fill that in, hand it in to someone, and there will be someone get in touch with you. So as we close, let's pray. Sovereign God, we cannot be other than amazed at the abundant grace that you lavish upon us, despite our waywardness and throughout the storms of life, whether of our own making or not. We are blessed by the confidence our relationship with you gives us to live our lives in this world, and by the hope that we hold on to for your kingdom to come and through eternity. Thank you for being king of our lives. We respond to your goodness with a desire to live for you as we go out from this gathering this morning. May our worship continue throughout our daily lives in the days ahead. Amen. Amen. Let's pray the grace for one another as we part this morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.